Good morning, everyone. I'm Amber Gunst. I'm the CEO of Austin Technology Council, and we are once again very excited, I think even more so today than every other day that we've had VCO lead or VCFO, sorry, um, lead this conversation on the Paycheck Protection Program because there were all kinds of updates late last week in the in the program. Um, and, and there was a lot more information that came out. So we actually delayed this until this week so that they could do some more digging into this. They could get some more information. We have been very fortunate to have excellent questions come through Slido every single time that we've done this with the team at BCFO. And so we're going to continue to use Slido for those questions today. The code is 62047, and it is on the bottom of the slide deck here, but again, it's 62047. Please load up your questions. The team is fantastic. They're completely knowledgeable, and if what they don't know, they dig in, they get the answers for. But right now, I'm going to pass this over to Jennifer Lenars because she's the one with the information, and that's who I think we need to hear from moving forward. So, Jennifer? Thank you very much, Amber, and welcome, everybody, to our our fourth in a series um, that we've been doing on the PPP program. You know, at the beginning, when we were asked to do this, I was kind of wondering how are we going to do this for four different parts and talk new material to talk about the PPP program? Well, they're taking care of that for us. Um, one thing that I know about this program is there are constantly changes. So we have a lot of new material today. First, a little bit about VCFO. VCFO is a professional services firm providing finance, HR, recruiting support that started here in Austin in 1996. Uh, we have a full team solution when we go in and provide assistance to our clients. We'll provide a CFO overseeing things, controller, system controller, HR, and recruiting resources, whatever the client needs. So why are we experts in the PPP program? Well, today we have helped over 45 clients get over $20 million in PPP loans. So we have sort of been in the middle of it, following all of it, and through all of the changes. Me, so I'm a consulting CFO with VCFO. I've been a, a finance and, and accounting in Austin for almost 30 years now, starting with Big Four Public Accounting and then going into industry, an industry that roles as controller, chief financial officer, chief financial officer for three of Austin tech startups. I specialize in private equity and venture back technology startup, and that's where my whole career has been. Joining me today is one of our other consulting CFOs, Regina Walters, and I'll let her introduce herself. Regina? Hi, thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hope that it's bright and early. Hope everyone had their first cup of coffee. Um, I'm, as Jennifer said, I'm Regina Walters. I'm also a consulting chief financial officer at VCFO been in the finance and accounting industry for almost 25 years, and in the past 20 years, I've been in Austin. So I've made a, Austin officially my home. I wanted to thank Austin Technology Council for hosting this series of webinars. Um, since the app was signed in March, I've been on a task force team at CFO, researching and reviewing all the guidance that's been published by the SBA Treasury and other sources. Um, I've also been assisting companies with their loan applications and providing feedback with them, helping them maximize their loan forgiveness. Um, it's definitely been a roller coaster of information right now. I'm just trying to navigate all the changes that have been published these past few months. Um, I feel like I've been eat, sleeping, and breathing the PPP loan. So, um, as you will see, as Jennifer presents the information today, there's still a lot of unknowns that need to be addressed for the loan forgiveness application. Um, as Amber stated earlier, um, go ahead and put your questions in Slido. Um, and Jennifer and I will address as many questions as we can during this webinar. 
Uh, for the questions that we don't have time to address, we'll provide the answers to ATC for distribution. And with that, I'll hand this back over to Jennifer, start the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Regina. Okay, so our agenda today is we're gonna go through the latest change. So the latest change is the PPP Flexibility Act of 2020. Um, we're gonna go through some expectations. We're gonna go through uh, loan for forgiveness application as it exists at this point in time. We're also gonna run through some example calculations. So we're gonna show you, or I'm gonna to explain to you the impact, the changes in salaries and changes on FTEs have based on what we know today. We'll also run through what is required as far as documentation, some additional considerations to think about as we move forward. And then we're gonna go over the important dates um, because everything that's happening here is date driven. So it's important that you understand what these dates are. And then lastly, we're gonna open up for questions uh, and please, as was stated by Amber and Regina, we are using Slido for questions. The code is 62047. So let's jump right in. So PPP Flexibility Act of 2020. This is the latest change that has occurred to the Payroll Protection Program. It was signed into law last Friday, June the 5th. Um, and it made some rather significant changes. Um, in addition to it being signed into law, this week, the Treasury issued revisions to their first interim final rule. These were issued literally two days ago on June 10th. Now, one of the things that I want to mention about this program is, as we have learned over these past eight weeks or so, or since, you know, since I've been doing these presentations, is the only consistent part of the program has been that it's gonna change. So we're gonna provide information based on what we know today. I will try to point out areas where we expect changes, where we don't expect changes, but there's gonna be more guidance coming out. So what is the big change that the PPP Flexibility Act of 2020 did to the program? Well, it changed what the Treasury calls their covered period. The covered period they're talking about here is the period that the, that the PPP program covers. This is different than the forgiveness covered period. I wish they could have come up with different terminology for the two periods, but they are both technically covered periods. So the period that's covered by this act is instead of being February 15th to June 30th, the period is now February 15th, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. So it has been extended out to the end of the year. Now, as part of this, the forgiveness covered period changed. If you remember, the forgiveness covered period was an eight week period, whether you use the standard covered period or the alternate covered period. That is now a 24 week period. So I do want to point out that the default period is now 24 weeks. However, borrowers with loans approved before June 5th, 2020 may elect to have the forgiveness covered period be the eight week covered period or the eight week alternate covered period, okay? Per the interim final rule is an election that these borrowers have to make. This is not the, this is not the default, the way that the interim final rule reads. So the other big change is that instead of 75% of loan proceeds being required to be used for payroll costs to get full forgiveness, you now only have to use 60% of the forgiveness amount for payroll costs and 40% for non-payroll costs. 
Okay. Now, when the original rule came out and was signed into law last Friday, they had put a cliff in there. So basically, the law read that if you didn't use 60% for payroll, none of it was going to be forgiven. However, that is not the way that the Treasury and SBA have interpreted it. Okay, so the interim final rule does state that if less than 60% of the total loan amount is used for payroll costs, the forgiveness amount will be reduced rateably. We're going to go into that calculation a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, they, their feeling was it was not the intent of Congress to have that cliff in there, uh, which has been supported by people um, in both the Senate and the House. So another thing that they have done is they have added two new safe harbors. So there were safe harbors associated with restoring wages and restoring FTEs. Well, there was a lot of pushback about those safe harbors because the safe harbor date was June 30th. And people in the restaurant industry around the country are only now being able to get back to business and they're not back at 100% capacity. So they were sort of being penalized because they, based on restrictions, regulatory restrictions in their locale, were not able to get back to where they might reasonably have full employment. So the two new safe harbors are if, if a borrower is unable to rehire either previous employees or similar qualified individuals, they will not get a reduction in loan forgiveness due to this reduction in FTEs. One of the big things we don't know about this is what is the documentation that's gonna be required? Okay, now I'm gonna go into documentation a little bit later on, but I would like people to keep that in their mind because we know from the safe harbors, they have very strict documentation requirements to be able to support, for example, that a job offer was made to a furloughed or a laid off employee and that person for whatever reason turned it down. You had to show the job offer in writing. They ideally wanted um, the rejection of that offer um, in writing. You had to be able to show that, you know, it was for the same wage, similar positions, et cetera. Now, the other, the other safe harbor that they've added is if a borrower is unable to return to pre-February 2020, levels of business activity as a direct result of COVID-19 related restrictions. So this would mean, for example, restaurant industry. If you are not able to have your restaurant 100% occupied, say you're only at 25%, 50%, depending on the locale that you're in, you can't get back to that level of activity. You're not gonna. You're not gonna be penalized for it. And this applies across all industries. Okay. Um, you know, another one that might be relevant is say you have a really small office space um, and you can't separate people far enough, and because of that, you can't get back to normal business activity. That is something that would also fall in there. Again, we don't know what documentation is going to be required. We fully expect that sort of guidance to be coming out uh, shortly. Okay, so for loans made on or after June 5th, 2020, the maturity is now five years, okay? So if you get, if you apply, there's, there's over a hundred billion dollars left in PPP loan funds. So there's still a lot of money for people out there to go and get. And the people that go out there, they get approved on or after June 5th, you automatically have that five-year maturity. So for loans made before June 5th, the maturity is still two years 
However, borrowers and lenders may mutually agree to extend that. Okay, so that's a little typo there. That should say the maturity is to, is two years. However, borrowers and lenders may mutually agree to extend it to five years. Now, are borrowers are lenders going to be willing to do that? We don't. I mean, you know, sort of our feeling is. You know, you're asked, a lender is being asked to take a 1% loan that has a two-year maturity, maturity and send it out to five years at 1%. Uh, what we sort of expect to see lenders do is when you go in and try to extend it, them offer some other type of vehicle um, that's somewhere between maybe their normal lending practices and the 1%. But we will see how, we will see how this turns out. Also, uh, I sort of believe because now the new loans will have five years, I think we're going to see the market for packaged and reselled loans increase because lenders won't want these on, the, on their books for five years. They'll package them up. They'll sell them to somebody else. Remember, if your lender is doing that, the person that they are sending it to or the person that is purchasing a loan they're the ones that you're now going to have to work with for forgiveness. Okay. So another big change is borrowers now have 10 months from the end of the loan forgiveness covered period to submit the loan forgiveness application. There really wasn't any guidance before. And we were getting a lot of questions of when do I have to have all this documentation submitted? It's a lot of documentation. Well, now they have said, you have to have it submitted within 10 months. Also, no principal or interest payments need to be made until the SBA remits the forgiveness amount to the lender or notifies the lender that none of the amount is forgiven. Okay, you have 10 months to submit the paperwork. It's on current guidance. The lender has 60 days to review it get it to the SBA. The SBA has 90 days to make their decision on it. So now we're looking at a, potent, a period potentially as long as 15 months. Um, and then finally here, the SBA is going to be issuing a modified forgiveness application as well as revisions to its interim final rules. It's very important. We have two agencies issuing interim final rules. So it can get a little bit of a little bit confusing at times, but Treasury has its own interim final rules. SBA has its own interim final rules. They do address different topics. It's very important to look at both of them. Uh, we are expecting a lot more information to come out. There are still lots of questions. You know, for example, you know, right now we have eight weeks and 24 weeks. What if you've used up all your money in 12 weeks? Do you have to wait? We don't know the answer to that. So, um, also, you know, another part, just a little bit follow on on that is, you know, June 30th was originally our safe harbor date. Now it's December, thir December 31st. You know, does that mean you have to keep your FTE level and salary levels all the way until December 31st? What happens if you're a seasonal? What happens if as a natural cycle of business, your employment levels traditionally go down during that period? Again, it's just things that we don't have the answer to yet. So. On other updates, um, the initial loan forgiveness application as well as instructions were issued on May 15th. As I mentioned a minute ago, the SBA has stated they will be providing a modified application. They have to provide a modified application because a lot of dates have changed. So they are providing a modified application. Also, so the original application was 11 pages long, and I think it was Forbes that quoted, you either needed to be an accountant, an attorney, or have a degree in mathematics to understand it. It is a very, it is very complex and it is very detailed. 
the SBA has stated that they are going to simplify the application. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what their idea of simplification is, um, but hopefully they will do something. Uh, the SBA did issue an interim final rule on May 22nd. Uh, this interim final rule had to do with a lot of the questions that people had um, around the mechanics behind the application. Um, so a couple pieces too is for given amount is reduced if salaries or wages are reduced more than 75%. So the forgiveness application says you can reduce salaries and wages to a certain extent. They understand that. But once that amount of reduction goes beyond 25%, you start getting penalized for it on your, on your reduction, okay? And so to be clear, the period for that calculation is January 1st to March 31st, okay? So right before COVID, they're gonna look at your salaries right before and then during your covered period to see what's taking place. Forgiven amount is also reduced if headcount is reduced, okay? Um, again, I'll go through that calculation here shortly. Um, when you're looking at F this um, reduction due to uh, in forgiveness due to an FTE reduction, this comparison occurs between your covered period and then a selected reference period. And we'll talk about what that selected reference period is here in a minute. Okay, so quick review. We've been over this a couple times before. These are some things that did not change. What is, what are eligible payroll costs? So you can include payroll costs paid and or incurred during the covered period or alternate covered period. If your covered period began on April 30th and you had a pay run on May 5th, May 1st, that May 1st, that May 1st pay run, the cash that you spend for payroll, that is an included expense. On the back end, you are also allowed to include expenses that were incurred but not paid. Now, I'm going to make a caveat around this because this is based on the guidance in the existing forgiveness application. We do not know what sort of changes will come out in the modified application. Do not really expect material changes to that, but we shall see. Um, comp Compensation, what are they calling cash compensation? Gross wages, gross salary, gross tips, gross commissions, paid leave, um, separation payments, uh, bonuses. They really have tried to be all inclusive, you know. So if you really think about it, a lot of the things that they're including here are the pieces that show up in W-2 wages, okay? Also, Non-cash compensation, contributions to employee health insurance, contributions to employee retirement plans, state and local taxes on employee compensation. Please note that is only state and local taxes on employee compensation. Cash compensation of employees cannot exceed an annual salary of $100,000 on a prorated basis. Now, under the eight
Hi, everybody. It looks like we're having a little bit of technical difficulties with Jennifer's computer. We'll have Regina join us here in just a moment to continue the conversation. And it looks like Regina is here. Hi, Hi everyone. I probably won't be as, as good as Jennifer on this because she's been our presenter for all the the webinars, but um, we just, as she was talking about uh, eligible payroll costs for the application, um, let's see. Yeah, so I think cash compensation, so right now it can't exceed an annual salary of $100,000. Um, the current application has it capped at $15,385. Dollars um, for annual salaries of $100,000. Um, we're hoping to see this number increase um, with the um, increase of the 24 week period, um, but we have to wait until we see the application to see if they'll increase this cap for employees. So, can we go to the next slide? So, eligible non payroll costs. So again, this is very similar to the payroll costs. And again, as Jennifer said, this is on the application. Um, the, these costs can be paid or incurred during the covered period. Um, and if they're incurred, they just must be paid on or before the next regular billing cycle. So say you have your utilities bill and it was uh, incurred through the end of the month, the 30th, but you don't pay it until the 7th, you are allowed to use through the 30th for that bill. And it actually looks like Jennifer's back on, so I will yes. hand this over to Jennifer. Thanks. Sorry about that, everybody. So apparently there was a little, inter a little internet hiccup. I'm actually surprised this is the first time it's incur occurred after doing um, eight of these presentations um, in various areas around Texas. Um, so um, again, most of the items on this have not changed. You know, the big thing is paid and incurred. So one of the pieces of guidance that came out in the latest interim final rule from the, S from the SBA is if you have utilities and say your utility bill, say your PPP loan started on April 1st. You got your utility bill for March that was due on the 5th and you paid it on the 5th because that payment was made in the covered period. You get to include that pay payment. Now you move forward and say you have a period at the end of your, or a utility period at the end of your covered period, but you haven't paid it yet. You can include that incurred cost as long as it is paid on the next regular due date. You cannot prepay items, but they really did it so that they really didn't want people playing games with it. It does let you under the eight week period cover more than eight weeks of expenses based on incurred and or paid. Um, we have gotten a little bit more clarity into utility payments. Um, but again, there's still a lot of unknown questions. Um, transportation. You know, we don't know exactly what is included in transportation at this point in time. Pretty much the consensus with everybody that I've talked to and things that I've read and other webinars is that if you have some sort of delivery function in your business and you are paying for gas and vehicles, that that gas expense is an, is an eligible non-payroll cost. Telephone, we don't have any, any clarity on whether cell phones are included or not. You know, some companies nowadays, they don't have a landline. Everybody uses their cell phones. So you'll be able to see. We also don't know if like Zoom meetings or, you know, Starleaf meetings or anything like that is included, okay? And remember to maximize forgiveness, you cannot exceed 40% 
um, in non-payroll costs. And I'll show you, as I mentioned earlier, I'll show you that calculation here in a minute. Okay? So the loan forgiveness application, as I mentioned earlier, and instructions, 11 pages long. It looks like it's tax form is subject to modification. The, the SBA has said they're going to modify it. There are things that we think will stay the same. There are things that we think will change. Okay. So the application as it current stands includes instructions, a forgiveness calculation form, a Schedule A, a Schedule A worksheet, an FTE reduction safe harbor worksheet. Uh, they've asked for demographic information, but that's optional. And very importantly, there's a certification. So I'll go through some of the things on that certification um, so that everybody understands what's involved there. So let's look at let's look at some of the mechanics of the way this works um, based on the current application that we have out there. So say you have a PPP loan for $150,000, okay? You incur 73,200 in payroll costs over a forgivable covered period. Now, I used 24 weeks when I did this example. In fact, I used four employees. I had one at $65,000 annual. I had three hourly employees at $20 an hour when I did all these examples that we're about to go through. So 73, I think in this example, the part-time employees were at 30 hours a week. So 73,200 in payroll costs, 56,800 in non-payroll costs, okay? I assume no wage reduction adjustment and no FTE reduction adjustment. So next I went and came up with what they call a modified total. That's just adding the compensation and the non-payroll expenses. And lo and behold, it equals the PPP loan amount of 130,000. Next, we have to look at the payroll requirement of at least 60%. So the way that the application has us do that is you take the total payroll cost of 73,200 Divide them by the 60% requirement, okay? At 60%, that means our forgiveness amount is capped at 120, 122,000. Because 73,200 is 60% of 122,000. Our forgiven amount is 122,000. 8,000, you can either give back to the lender or it rolls over into a loan at 1% interest. So in our next example, we're gonna look at the effect of an FTE reduction, okay? So in this case, during the period, we had total compensation of 51,600. This is because compensation went down because the hours that the part-time employees worked went down. Now, when you look at FTEs, the current guidance has two ways of calculating FTEs. And this was sort of a surprise to all of us when it came out, because it turns out that, you know, normally for benefits and things like that, we consider an FTE anybody working over 30 hours. In the calculation in the current forgiveness app, one FTE is somebody that works 40 hours or more, counts as one FTE. There are two methods to calculate FTEs. The first method is you take actual hours worked, divide by 40, round to the nearest 10, and it's not to exceed one. Okay, so this works great for people that track hours um, and know exactly how much everybody works. There is also a simplified method. The simplified method is you just say, anybody that works 40 hours or more counts as one. 
Anybody that works less than 40 hours counts as 0.5. We highly recommend that you do both calculations because you can get different answers depending on which calculation you use. You do have to use the same methodology in both your covered period and your reference period. You cannot use diff different methodologies. So basically for this calculation, um, we kept the, I kept the non-payroll expenses the same. I said there's no salary wage adjustment and I went in and said, looked at, what I did was took the part-time employees that were at 30 hours a week, reduced their time to 15 hours a week, did the calculation again. So in the reference period, we had 3.4 FTEs. In our covered period, 2.2. We divide the 2.2 by the 3.4, and we get an FTE reduction quote of 0.65. We put that in the application as 0 0.65, 0 0.65, and then we do a modified total. So we take the 51,600, the 56,800, multiply it by 0.65, and now we have a modified total of 67,860 on a PPP loan amount of 130,000. The other thing we have to do is we still have to look at our payroll cost requirement. So 51,600 divided by 0.6 gives us the 86,000, now we take the lower of the modified total payroll cost requirement and see that the modified total is the lower amount, so it becomes our forgiveness amount, okay? So that FTE reduction quotient had a significant impact on the amount of funds that are forgiven. So the, last, the next calculation we're going to look at is the effect of a salary wage reduction. Now, the impact of this has actually been reduced um, with uh, the advent of 60% requirement for payroll costs compared to when it was 75%. Okay, so I assumed all employees take a 30% salary wage reduction. Hours worked remain the same, okay? So because hours worked remain the same, FTEs remain the same, and we have a 1.0 reduction quotient, no impact. Now, the wage reduction adjustment says that you are allowed to have a 25% reduction. So what you have to do, and you have to do this on an individual basis, you have to compare the cover period wages to the wages in the reference period, which for this calculation is January 1st to March 31st, reduce those by 20%, and then the difference between the two becomes your salary wage reduction amount adjustment. So 3,660. We now have a modified total of 104,380 because we took our 51,240. 56,800 and subtracted 3,660. We do our same payroll cost requirement, so 51,240 divided by 60. This time, it is still that payroll cost, that payroll requirement that is driving our forgiveness amount because the payroll cost requirement of 60% is lower than our modified total. Um, so 85,000 is our forgiven amount. Now, I do want to point out that I've run through those two things, and I've had this question before, and that's will people get double penalized? There was an FTE reduction and there was a salary reduction. No, you will not get penalized twice, okay? When they look, when the application looks 
at the salary and wage reduction for hourly employees, you are looking at their hourly rate. So you actually do the calculations. Hourly rate during the reference period, hourly rate during the covered period. When you do that hourly rate, if that hourly rate action, you then take that hourly rate, that reduced hourly rate, and multiply it out to get what the reduction amount is. If you have both FTE, so say you have an employee where you went, hours went down and their wages went down. You will be penalized for the hour reduction and you'll be penalized for the wage reduction, but they will be two in pieces. They will not, they will not be. They have ensured that there is no double counting and you don't get penalized twice. So here I just wanted to look at the options that I mentioned before. And these are actual numbers that I used in my calculation earlier. So here's our average hours work during the reference period and the covered period. Reference period, our full-time employee was 40. Our part-time employees were 30. During the covered period, this is for the forgiven covered period, on a weekly basis, 40 for the full-time and fifth for the salaried, I should say, and 15 for the hourly employee. Now, I use the regular method first, which means I take the actual hours worked, divide them by 40, and come up with the number rounded to the nearest 10. So for the hourly employees, 0.8 FTEs. In the reference period, 0.4. This is where the 3.4 and the 2.2 came from. Now, let's see what happened if we took the simplified method. Simplified method for the salaried employee, because there were 40 hours in both periods, makes no difference whatsoever. However, in the simplified method, our hour employees, because they were below 40, they all count as 0.5. They were below 40 before, they were below 40 after. Doesn't make any difference that they went from 30 hours to 15 hours. They still get counted as 0.5. There was no FTE reduction in this. This will not always be the case that the simplified method works best. We highly recommend you do both calculations and determine which one works the best for individual circumstance. Okay, so there are also a couple of safe harbors. So for reduction of FTEs and reduction of salaries, okay? Um, and these safe harbors eliminate the adjustment associated with wage reduction. So the first one we'll go through is the wage reduction. So if you restore wages by December 31st, this used to be June 30th, now it's December 31st, to levels in the pay period that included February 15th, 2020, and this is a very important and, and the reductions occurred between February 15th, 2020 and April 26th, 2020, you meet the safe harbor. Now I have had people ask, well, what is, why did they come up with that period? Well, remember February 15th, is the date of the beginning of the entire covered period for the PPP program. April 26 is 30 days after the CARES Act was passed. So basically they said, if you did this before you knew about the, the CARES Act and within 30 days of the CARES Act being passed, when things became more clear, we're gonna give you an out. However, if you made these changes after April 26, you don't get that out. You have to go through the calculation. Okay. There is a similar, there is a similar safe harbor for FTE reductions. FTEs must be restored by December 31st to the levels in the pay period that included February 15th, 2020. And again, the reductions must have incurred between February 15th and April 26th, 2020.
Okay? So, you're going to have to sign a certification. Your certification states that you use the funds to pay costs that are eligible for forgiveness. It also says, the statement also says that payroll costs were to retain employees. You are allowed to pay bonuses. If you pay bonuses, our rep recommendation is make sure that you document that those bonuses intent was to retain the employees because everything about this program is retention of employees okay uh, all applicable reductions due to decrease employee wages and wage reductions are included so i want to make sure that, that everybody understands when you do this and you do the calculation these calculations are done on an employee by employee basis. So you literally have to look at every pay period during um, the covered period. So, okay, because the covered period is now 24 weeks, you are going to have to have the documentation for the 24 weeks beginning from um, your disbursement date all the way to the end of that 24 week period and do all these calculations. Um, the Tax form submitted or consider, consist of those uh, submitted to IRS state or work agencies. Um, and this certification has some teeth in it. There are um, significant civil and criminal penalties associated with this. Okay, what do you need to require? So basically you need to provide all the payroll documentation to verify cash compensation and not non-cash benefit periods. Report party payroll providers, bank statements, tax forms that overlap with covered period, payment receipts or account statements showing documentation. We highly recommend you put all of the into a separate folder, you know, it could be 12 months from now that the SBA is reviewing it. You don't want to be scrambling looking for all this stuff. Um, again, you got to have all the support for FTEs from February 15th to December 31st, 2020. Okay. Um, you're going to need that salary information, you know, for that period too, as well as the period from January 1st to March 31st because that's your comparative period. Okay. Okay. So you also need to have documentation to verify existence of obligations and services prior to February 15th, 2020. You have to provide your lease agreements. You have to provide your mortgage. Lease agreements, you know, you might be writing a check that includes CAM, they're going to see what your CAM amount is because they get your lease agreement. And technically at the moment, CAM is not a covered expense. You'll need copies of utility invoices, cancel checks, account statements, something verifying payment. Okay. There is also additional documentation that is required to be retained but not submitted. There's also a requirement that documentation be kept for six years following loan forgiveness. Okay, so really, you know, that could be seven and a half years that you need to keep this documentation. Okay, um, what's required to be maintained, not submitted, anything to do with this program. Everything that you did relating to the forgiveness application, um, you know, everything that supports employees with an annualized rate of more than 100,000. Uh, when you are doing the salary reduction calculation, you get to exclude any employee that made more than $100,000 in any, or you have to exclude any employee that made more than $100,000 in any pay period in 2019. You literally have to go back to all those pay periods and do calculations to see if the annualized rate was over $100,000 in any of those pay periods 
And then that person falls on table two in the application instead of table one. Okay. Documentation regarding employee job status change, you know, also safe harbors, you know, safe harbors include employees that would not come back to work. You made them an offer. They wouldn't come back. You need all that documentation. And we are sure there's going to be significant documentation around the new safe harbors as well. Additional considerations, please make sure you document necessity, even if you have a loan below $2 million. They have, the SBA and Treasury have said, loans below $2 million, it will be uh, deemed necessary because at that size, you don't have access with assets. There's still, they can still review it. So, we're, and you still might be selected for audit. If you're over $2 million, you're going to get audited. Below $2 million, you're still subject to audit. Document. Continue discussions with your lender. Talk to lender about forgiveness applications. Can I get this forgiven? Can I get that forgiven? Keep a spreadsheet. Here's the things that we know that can be forgiven. Here's my gas. Here's my electricity. Here's my water. I don't know about cell phones, so let's put this one down here in questionable. I'm, you know, I'm a delivery company and I reimburse employees for mileage on their cars. Is that forgivable? We don't know. Put that in an unknown category. So as guidance comes out, you can easily move between one and the other category. Work with payroll providers, see what they can do to these reports, because we know we have done these very, very, very time-consuming reports to do. Um, very importantly, forgiven amounts will not be considered cancellation of indebtedness for federal income tax purposes. Plus, the downside is expenses paid where the amounts forgiven are not eligible for tax deductions the way the laws currently are. To change that, that is IRS rules. To change that is going to take an act of Congress. So I want everybody to be aware of that. Please prioritize PPP loan forgiveness, forecasting, documentation, and reconciliation with accounting, finance, HR, legal. Um, you know, HR is going to be very involved in this, you know, especially when you're documenting, you know, inability to be able to and hire employees. You better have good job descriptions and you better be able to show that somebody didn't meet a required part of that job description to say that you couldn't hire somebody. And be prepared for changes. There's going to be changes. There's constantly been changes the whole time. Go to VCFO's website. We have a landing page. We have links to SBA, Treasury, we have a Q&A section. We keep all these webinars out there. Check all the time. Go to Treasury. Go to SBA. You know, Friday evenings, for some reason, they like to come out with new guidance. We'll see what happens this evening. So important dates. I'm going to run through these really quickly. Your loan disbursement date, this is the beginning of your period your covered period for forgiveness. February 15th, in-service date, and it's also the hourly wage reduction safe harbor date. So pay period that includes February 15th for salary and wage reductions, very important. February 15th to June 30th, 19th. Now this is one of the reference periods that you can pick for the FTE calculation. So I this period, this one very well might become February 15th to December 30th. Um, I would sort of expect it to change, but this is what's in the current guidance. The other reference period for the FTE calculation is January 1st, 2020 to February 29th, 2020. You know, and that's really for, for new businesses. Please note that for the FTE reduction and the salary reduction, you are comparing different periods. FTE reduction is your reference period. Salary reduction is January 1st to March 31st, 2020, okay? They wanna see what happened 
right before the PPP program and then during the PPP program. Uh, there is optional dates uh, for seasonal employers, which is basically any 12 week period between May 1st and September 15th. We're gonna have to see if there's some changes to that period, because um, I think there's some issues with the current guidance and the new 24 weeks relates to seasonal employees. So hopefully we'll see some more guidance around that. And then our last important date is February 15th, April 26th. Remember, that's the FTE safe harbor. To get the safe harbor, reductions had to have occurred during that period. The safe harbor date for, for um, comparative purposes for FTEs and wages is now December 31st, 2020. This was June 30th. Okay, that ran a little bit longer than I was expecting, and sorry for that little hiccup we had with internet. But now it's time for some question, for questions and answers. So please, as we mentioned before, put your questions in Slido. The Slido code, if you do not have it, is 62047. So I will hand off to Regina to answer the first question for us. Hi, thanks, Jennifer. Um, I One of the first questions, and I just will go over it again, it was, are there any updates on the $100,000 cap? I cannot see where the eight week period has been stretched to 24 weeks. Um, and you are correct. Right now, there um, for the eight week period, it is capped at 15385 for employees that um, have an annual salary of over $100,000. Um, we expect the new application will provide more guidance to increase that amount for the 24 week cover period. We just need to wait for that application. And also note that um, the old application had very specific guidance for owner employees, self-employed individuals or partners. And we expect there to be more guidance on that cap there as well. Okay, okay. thank you, Regina. Yeah, as, as we, I mentioned during the presentation, there are a lot of things that we just don't have answers to at the moment. And, you know, the big piece we're missing is we haven't gotten any guidance yet from the SBA on PPP Flexibility Act. So we expect that at any point in time. I mean, if not today, hopefully we will get it early next week. Um, we do expect that number to go, to go up. Um, it doesn't really make much sense if it doesn't go up. Um, the next question is, are businesses able to apply for more funds now that the loan period has been extended? The original application was based on 24 week, on eight weeks, not 24 weeks. So at the moment, the act does not have any provisions to request more funding. Um, when applications were done and the current application still uh, look at two and a half months of pay to determine the loan amount. I don't know if they are going to make any changes, um, but as we sit here today, no, you are not, you are not able to uh, request a re request additional funds. One other thing I should point out is currently. New applications are still required to be submitted by June 30th. So that clock is ticking, tick, tick, tick. So one thing I can do is you will not actually find that in the Flexibility Act. There was a side letter done between a couple of senators. And that side letter is where they determined that the PPP program for new applications is not going to go beyond June 30th. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, besides the questions that we had on Slido, we did uh, receive uh, questions as you guys um, signed up for the webinar. And there was uh, a question about, we have not reduced salaries during this period, but some take-home pay has been reduced due to reduced commissions. Is this considered compensation reduction that could affect loan forgiveness? And yes, um, this could impact your loan forgiveness. So compensation is considered payroll costs. They did clarify that in the interim final rule that they published on May 22nd. 
So they constitute a supplement to salary wages and they're a similar form of compensation is what they're considering um, uh, commissioned. So when you receive the, when you complete the application, you will have to go and do the 25% uh, wage reduction application for every employee compared to the period of January 1st through March 31st. So you'll have to go through this exercise and documentation and then that way you'll uh, be able to determine if your loan forgiveness amount will be impacted. So there was one last question I, I saw in Slido. Um, is uh, what if rent was renegotiated during the covered period to a new lease with a higher rent? More space was to support social distancing. Um, there is not specific guidance on this. I mean, the key is that the lease agreement had to be in place before February 15th. Um, if I was CFO of that company or that, or I was, um, that company was one of my clients, I would go to my lender. I would discuss this with the lender and I would argue that it should be included. I think if it was done with an amendment to an existing lease, I think you can say, yeah, the lease agreement was, was in place. Um, I think if it was done through a whole new lease that didn't reference the older lease, uh, I think that's something that's going to have to be discussed with the lender, but I think there is a strong argument that it should be included. Regina, what are your thoughts on that? I agree with you. Um, I think you'll have to work with the lender. And I also think if it is a, a lease amendment you d and you have to uh, increase your space because of social distancing, it may uh you, you may be able to get that forgiven with a bank, but ultimately it's going to be up to your uh, lender. And there may be some guidance in that too, um, as the workplace environments are changing and companies do need to make these uh, changes to their, uh, their space. Yeah. I mean, we do fully expect the SBA to come out with a whole new section of FAQs based on the flexibility act. So, um, because there are still a lot of questions we have, and hopefully we'll get some clarity. So, Regina, I think we have time for one last question, if you have one. Yeah, there is one that someone I emailed in um, that says, can you give raises to your current workers during the eight weeks? And uh, this is kind of very similar to bonuses. We haven't seen any guidance saying these are expressly allowed. But, you know, as, you know it brings up a couple of questions. As you're, you know, the borrower needs to consider if the loan is audited and you have justification for the raise, you know, why was the raise given? Was it because of work performance or was it loan forgiveness related or were they um, essential employees that were at risk when they had to go out to the workforce? So if you are giving raises, you just need to make sure you can verify the necessity for it. Yeah. Anything? Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, HR is a very, very important of this whole process. You need to make sure that your HR team is involved. Yes. Yeah. Well, good. That, oh, sorry, Regina, go ahead. I, don't know. I, I think that was about it. I think we got most of the questions answered. You're yeah. good. And, and Jennifer and Regina, thank you again. This has been such a great series for us. You, Your team has provided so much information and so much knowledge around this, especially with everything coming out so quickly. It's just been beyond impressive. And so if you have questions and need to reach out to the BCFO team, please reach out to our team at info at austintechnologycouncil.org. Again, that's info at austintechnologycouncil.org. And we can get you connected with a team member at BCFO to get your, answer, your questions answered. Um, just as we have done with all of the other programs with this, we're going to keep Slido open for another 45 minutes so that you can ask questions and we can get those over to the team and they can get answers for you. We will also be posting this online as well as giving the link out to each of you. And we'll also be sharing the slide deck with you as well, because there was so much information here. As Jennifer said, we went over, but at the yes. same time, 
we don't want to go under when there's a lot of, or we don't want to end on time or, or short of time when there is way too much information that our member companies need to get access to, to be able to protect themselves and their employees at all costs. So we will continue to provide information when we can and when it's available. But if you have any questions, again, for BCFO, you can reach out to them directly. You see their information here. But you can also reach out to our team, and we're happy to get you connected with them as well. I want to thank BCFO, especially Jennifer and Regina. You've been with us through this whole entire time. You've You've answered questions. We've gotten great information out. We appreciate you, and we're so grateful and so thankful that you took the time to do this with us and our members. And and look forward to seeing you all as soon as everything calms down a little bit, and we can all see each other. And and you know, just again to all of our ATC members, we are abiding by the city and the county's recommendations in regards to. Um, not hosting events during this time. If you are wondering when our events are going to start, we're looking at approximately 60 days after the work from home and social distancing recommendations end. So as soon as we have that information, we will get that out to you because we miss seeing you in person as much as you miss seeing each other in person as well. So I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Take good care and don't forget to call your dads and let them know that you appreciate them this weekend. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.